Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you into the church this morning. Thank you so much for making this your place of worship. A good number here with uh, in God's house. And we're just trusting the Lord to do great, 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 great and mighty things in each and every one of our lives right here. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's our privilege to have you here in the church. And our desire is that you'll know him before you leave this house here today. Our hope is all in Jesus Christ and our belief, dear Lord, is that he is the Savior of the world. So thank God for Jesus Christ and our Savior. Heaven's Jubilee is what we want to sing this morning, page 444.
62 in your notebooks right here. There rose a lamp.
wanted to do us a song this morning. Brother Wayne's had some soldier, shoulder surgery, and it's been quite some time since he's been able to play for us today. But uh, I'm blessed to have them here with us, and what a great blessing it is. They're uh, just a, a great asset to the kingdom of God right there. I was thinking about the songs that we were singing, like Miss Cindy was talking about. And, uh, you know, it said, let's let somebody testify, you know. And that's, you know, we ought to hear more of that in these days and times about what God's doing so great in our lives right there and how, how he sustains us from day to day and allows us to grow in the, in the great grace that he has given right there. Yes, Ms. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. God bless you, sis. Y'all listen as I sing. Nathan? Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, y'all pray for it. It's been a long time. And uh, we try. He gets to the floor, y'all just stand and help us sing it. Y'all should all know this song. Sometimes my burdens are so heavy And sometimes my trials are so great Sometimes Satan wins a battle But the war already won I got afraid Don't pray Sometimes world things I'm breaking up here. Always I can lean on Jesus. I don't know where to turn or what to Thank 
truly blessed church to have these musicians, singers, and everybody who uh, works and holds a position in the church because it wouldn't be possible without you. And remember, uh, Revival November 6th through the 9th with David Nix and a sign-up sheet for the Christmas play up front and the Samaritan's Purse. Donations can be made to Sheila Davidson as far as money. <coughs> and if you want to bring the items, we have drop boxes <coughs> upstairs and downstairs. And the deadline is October 29th. And the youth will be packing them on November 1st. There's a little flyer up front that specifies what can and cannot go in the boxes. And the fall festival, October 28th, this Friday, Saturday, I'm sorry, from 5 to 7. And the cake donations for the cake walk. And if you don't want to bake it, <clears throat> just uh, Miss Gail Loggins will take the donations. She'll bake it herself. And uh, Sheila Davidson needs candy for the candy bags for the fall festival. Please bring those by October 25th. And we need to meet with everyone who signed up and ordered tickets for the Hell's Gate in the choir loft after the service. In the household shower for Amy and Johnny Nation, Sunday, November 5th, times from 1 to 3 in the fellowship hall. And there will be a light meal every Wednesday before the service starting at 545. And don't forget Bible study tonight at 6 o'clock. Anything else? That was a lot. I'm out of breath. Any birthdays this week? David's got one tomorrow. Who wasn't going to mention it? Oh, was he? Anybody else? Cindy's got one next week. Cindy does? Okay. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Any unspoken prayer request? Somebody's been pointed at as far as the anniversary. Frankie and Mark. <laughs> Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. God bless you. Happy anniversary. 
Any unspoken prayer requests, raise a hand. We stand, we get some ushers, please. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day, Father, and this uh, <clears throat> place you give us to come to worship you, Father. Father, we truly are a blessed people, Father, for there's uh, so many people in this country, in this world today, Father, that didn't have this opportunity to come to a, a public place to worship you. They got to do it in private, Father. Father, just uh, for the remainder of this service, Father, just take Brother Austin, Father, just hide him behind the cross, Father, touch him spiritually, Father, physically, Father, Lord. That we'll see you and not him, Father. If there's that one here that's backslidden today, Father, or heavy burden, Father, just let him come and just bring everything to your feet, Father, and just leave it with you, Father. If there's that one here that's lost, Father, just prick their heart and just show them, Father, they're bound for hell today if they die, Father. Father, just uh, let them come to you, Father, just accept you as Lord and Savior, Father, and just use us for you in our everyday walk, our everyday talk, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here in the house of the Lord with us today. Appreciate you making good news your place of worship this morning. Good to look around the sanctuary and see folks that we've been missing that are back today and folks have been praying for. And uh, we're just thankful that, uh, uh, that you're here. And also, if you're joining us this morning online, uh, we appreciate you letting us be where you are today. And thank you for that. I realize that... Uh, uh, everyone here and everyone watching could have been doing something else somewhere else. And so we don't take that a bit for granted. Certainly have enjoyed all the worship today. And um, this month, one more Sunday left, uh, a couple of things that Brother Josh mentioned, uh, the fall festival, that is uh, next Saturday, I think he already said that. And then uh, I believe the cutoff date for some of that uh, that was needed, like the candy and things like that, is actually Wednesday night. Revival is two weeks to put that in perspective for you. And so uh, do pray for Brother David Nix. He'll be a blessing to you. He's the one the Lord placed on our heart. 
and uh, we're thankful that he can come. That'll be a Monday through a Thursday night. I told him that we'd let him get back home uh, on his weekend. He's from uh, northwest Georgia, so uh, we'll let him get back to Tunnel Hill, the Dalton area over there uh, after Thursday. Uh, but really, all that's up to the Lord, isn't it? Yes, it is. And so we'll leave that up to him. Uh, today, or this month, rather, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And um, also, too, I'm thankful that that's been expanded a little bit to recognize uh, all folks that are dealing with cancer, that kind of thing. If I were to ask uh, this morning, give you an opportunity, pretty much every person in here, especially every adult in here, uh, could tell us about somebody uh, that they know, love, respect, appreciate, that's got cancer, dealing with cancer, or some loved one uh, that you have lost to cancer. Uh, by way of hope this morning, and if this would be okay, and if you don't mind, if you're here today and you're a cancer survivor, would you just stand up for a moment, if you don't mind to do that, if you're here today and a cancer survivor. Look at that, that's hopeful, isn't it? <laughs> that is hopeful. Yes, it is. We appreciate that so very much that tells us hey that there is hope and so uh, almost weekly you'll see it show up on our prayer chain uh, a person uh, to pray for about cancer that kind of thing so I'm thankful as I say that the Lord is able uh, regardless of what we face you'll turn to first Peter chapter 3 look at verse 4 if you will first Peter chapter 3 verse 4 Pray for Nathan back there this morning. I gave him a small leaflet on all the scriptures. We may not use them all. Uh, but today, our message, the title is this, that the Lord had placed on our heart, Meekness, Control Strength, Enhanced Grace. I want to talk to you a little bit this morning, a few minutes about meekness. As you know, the Bible has more to say about meekness uh, than Joe Biden and the Democrats do about Donald Trump. I mean, it says a lot about meekness and so to cover just a small part of that uh, we need to use several scriptures uh, to give you the uh, uh, the illustrations and examples that we need uh, but if you look at verse 4 let me give you the context real quickly uh, in this uh, little Schofield study Bible that I have here uh, the caption is godly living in the home and in the church and so that's pretty much about what chapter 3 is about, uh, starts off with the relationships between wives and husbands, uh, goes on from that to uh, the relationship that you and I have with each other as a family in, in, um, of God. And then um, in, uh, in verse number 10 talks about uh, an internal desire, a loving life, these kind of things, desiring God's blessings. Uh, and so it goes on to talk about how you and I are what the Bible has called us to be salt and light uh, to the world and even reflects back to Noah's day uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, ability you and I should have uh, to hang in there and continue uh, the, to endure uh, in our faith. How many knows that uh, the scripture uh, would tell us the Bible said that bodily exercise profit little. That's what it said. It didn't say it didn't have any profit. Uh, but if you see a person and they're, uh, they're in good form, they're fit, uh, more than likely, especially if that person has a little bit of age on them, that just comes naturally to, uh, really, to young adult people. Uh, but after they start to get a little bit of age on them, you see a person like that, more than likely they work at that. Uh, more than likely they have a regiment or a routine of exercise and uh, they try to eat right, do things because... Uh, they feel like that if they can keep all of that uh, the right way it should be, that they will physically feel better, have more physical strength, that kind of thing, and studies have proven it to be right. Well, the scripture tells us in like manner that we are to exercise and practice our faith, uh, that you and I are to strengthen ourselves uh, in our faith. Uh, and we do that by allowing God to be God, trusting him as he is God, allowing him to do the things and to uh, bring to pass the things that he has promised to do and trusting him with that. And you might say, well, what's our part in that? Well, our part in that uh, is to be and to have a disciplined life drawing from, you remember what uh, Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 
uh, chapter number 8, I think it's verse 10, he said right there, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. And so we're drawing from that. We're drawing from what this book has to say about who we are in Christ, about what we have in Christ. And uh, friend, can I say to you today uh, that meekness attracts, if you will, the Holy Spirit to your life. That's an odd way of saying that, but what I'm saying is that it's an atmosphere uh, that the Holy Spirit thrives in, that he works in. And you and I can look at people in the Bible, I mean, great leaders in the Bible, and they were meek people. Now, let me give you uh, Webster's 1828 definition of meekness. Actually, he offers several. I'm going to give you the first two. Uh, he starts with softness of temper, mildness, gentleness, forbearance under injury and provocation. Uh, the second thing he puts in an evangelical sense is humility. Resignation, submission to divine will, without murmuring, opposed to pride, arrogance, a desire and ability through the Holy Spirit to turn from pride, self-indulgence, and self-centered nature and way. Now that's what he said that meekness is. Now the Bible, by the way, never instructs you and I to pray for humbleness. Have you ever noticed that? The Bible does not instruct us to pray for that. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us to humble ourselves. In other words, that you and I should have a desire and a determination and a willing to take that action to humble ourselves. He does not ask us to pray for it. I'm glad that he don't. Can you imagine what it would take to humble some people? Can you imagine how many things they'd have to lose to ever get them to the point and the place where they saw that they really needed God? Can you imagine that? So many people depend on their own abilities so many people depend on the blessings that God has given them, actually. Uh, so many people depend on the things that they have, the connections that they have, their social standings, all these kind of things. All of those things are complimentary, not criticizing those things. But I'm just saying, hey, whatever we do have, we have because he allowed us to have it. And so we need to put the, th the thanks and the appreciation where it belongs. And so he tells us to humble ourselves. As a matter of fact, Peter tells us that if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God in chapter 5, uh, that he will lift us up. James says in chapter number 4, I didn't give Nathan these scriptures, uh, but James said in chapter number 4 that he resists the proud. He resists the proud. Imagine that. God purposely resists something. He resists pride. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Uh, being humble uh, is, is hand in hand and causes and generates and fosters, if you will, meekness. And so, look at verse 4. He said, or, or <clears throat> excuse me, verse 4, he said, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, that word quiet just simply means without complaint, which is in the sight of God of great price. God sees this as very valuable. In your Bible, you don't find too many things when it relates to something we're doing that God sees as great price. If you remember uh, when in the Gospels when uh, Christ was told of the Jews about the centurion that had built them a, a uh, synagogue, you remember that passage, and how that he had a servant that was like a son to him that was about to die. And so they told him, they said, this man's done a lot for our nation, and so it would be right if you would go down and heal this servant. And so the Lord starts his way down there, only to have this centurion send a messenger to him as he gets close and said, I'm not worthy for you to come under this roof. He said, uh, you don't need to come down here, just speak the word. And he gave an, a, an example from his own life as him being a man of authority. He said, you have authority. In other words, you have the authority just to say this, just to tell him to be healed from where you are. And he said, it'll happen. He said, this, you don't have to come down here. And the Bible said that the Lord marveled 
because he had not found that kind of faith. What was that man demonstrating? He was demonstrating submission. That's what he was demonstrating. He was submitting even though he was a Roman centurion over a hundred elite Roman soldiers over the garrison that kept the village that he was in even though he had all of that authority, had the most authority of anyone there. Uh, but he submitted to the authority of Christ and said, you have the authority to do this. You don't have to come down here. How many prayers could we get answered if we get that same attitude? <laughs> you don't have to come down here. <laughs> Just speak the word and it'll be done. Submit to that authority. In meekness, you and I can do that. In meekness, you and I can accomplish those kind of things. You'll notice that in verse 4 here, he said, God saw this of great value. Isn't it good today uh, that God can look into our lives and see something uh, that is great in value? By the way, why would he see that? As of great value, can I say today that the Holy Spirit cannot work through an ill-tempered person? The Holy Spirit cannot work through a prideful person. He cannot work through a, glory, for, through a glory grabber. He cannot work through a self-centered person. He cannot work through those kind of people. Can he work on them? Absolutely. But can he work through them? Not so good. <laughs> We see in the Bible he has used people like that to bring about his will. Nebuchadnezzar was a very prideful person. Nebuchadnezzar was a person who felt like that he had did it all, uh, that he had made it all happen. You remember chapter 4 of Daniel. Uh, you remember how Nebuchadnezzar said at the end of his derangement, at the end of his time of chastisement, uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, I praise and extol the God of heaven. Uh, why? Because he exalted him. He said uh, that it, he was actually, I'll paraphrase, he was actually in charge. You and I don't have any problem being humble and meek when we come to the realization that God is actually in charge. And when we do that, friend, can I say to you today, that's worth a lot in the eyes of God. Amen. <laughs> What's the greatest thing I could do for him? Submit myself. Be humble. Allow the strength of meekness. That control, listen, that will control my life. If you will, that discipline that self-control, I call it self-control, but actually it's meekness because I believe that he fights my battles. I believe that he provides for me. I believe that he brings about provision. I believe that he opens doors. Romans chapter number 12 tells me not to take vengeance because he said, vengeance is mine, I shall repay. I believe he'll do that. I believe he'll take up my cause. He said he would, hallelujah. All of that comes through meekness. Not me doing it myself, but him doing it. What did Jesus tell the Pharisees? Very prideful people. My goodness, Nathan, I don't know if we'll use any of that list I gave you or not. The Lord's not going that direction. Hey, but what did he tell them? They were so prideful, they wanted to be recognized. They would stand out in the marketplace with their scriptures sewn in their hymns and all this kind of thing in the hymns of their garment, having their phylacteries, all their, you know, their little scriptures and things like this. Stand out there and pray. Be all sanctimonious and all religious and pious. <laughs> he told them, he said, you're like, you're like whitewashed graves. In other words, you're like a nice cemetery. That's <laughs> what you're like. You're like going up there and having an impressive monument about a monument about, you know, what a life should be. Like you and I look at the monuments we have of our loved ones. He said, you're like that, but inside you're just like that. You're dead. There's nothing living about you. But he told those Pharisees, he said, when you come to a feast, when you're invited to an event, he said, you take the back seat. You take the low seat. You come in there and you take that one that's way back there. You take that lowest place because what they wanted to do, they wanted to take the front seat. They wanted to be recognized. They wanted to be noticed. And the Lord said, he said, you'll take that back seat. He said, then that, uh, that one who has put on the, the event, that one, that host of the event, he'll come back there and he'll come and get you and he'll bring you up here. And he said, then you'll be honored. But he said, if you take the front seat and somebody comes in with more digni more clout, there's more dignified, if you will, recognizes in a higher position than you, he said, you're going to be embarrassed because that governor is going to take you, put you back in the back seat, make you give up your seat to somebody else. Oh, friend, how many times has the Lord had to take us back in our life? 
How many times has he had to remove us out of that seat of self-righteousness and out of that seat of self-will and take us back out of that seat where we wanted to be recognized and built up and honored in ourselves? How many times? Maybe none for you, but he has for me. It's not that I ever felt like I was feeling all that good about myself, but I'm here to tell you today, friend, listen. Don't worry about it. If you've got pride in your life, he's able to get that out. If you've got self-dependence in your life, he's able to change those conditions. He's able to do some things. I tell you, I've heard people say, oh, this will never happen to me. This will never, you know, I'll never have to deal with this. Only to see later. Yes, they did. Yes. You and I just do not know, do we? Oh, we can trust God with the future, but we need to trust him with everyday living. Amen. And being meek is a part of that. Being meek is part of having ourselves prepared to receive, prepared to uh, have the Holy Spirit working in our life. Why? Because a meek person, they'll give God glory. A meek person, friend, will be quick to tell you God has did these things. The Lord has made this happen. The Lord has brought this about. The Lord has provided this. The Lord has caused this. I'm telling you, they'll tell you that. And I'll tell you something else a meek person will do too. A meek person will, listen, they will bring the Lord into their situations and conditions as well. I mean a meek person, a person of a gentle, quiet spirit, a teachable person, a person that desires to honor God, friend. Listen, they're like, listen, not only will they pray for somebody in need, they're liable to pray for one of their critters. They're liable, listen, whatever it is that has burdened their heart, they'll just take it to the Lord. Why? Because he said to. In 1 Peter chapter number 5, he said, cast your cares upon the, on him because he cares for you. He told them to do that. <laughs> yes, you remember last Sunday, it's just what they're supposed to do. And so he did that. But through meekness, he works like that. Through meekness, he brings that about. If you, if you think today, well, if we're not supposed to pray to be humble, then how do we pray? If we do have a problem with pride, if we are, if we sense or we think we are arrogant, if we do have a problem with those kind of things, we do have a problem with temper, those kind of things, incontinence, not being able to, uh, you know, hold that, this kind of thing. There's some people, and in their mind, they've got this line drawn back there. And so in their mind, they would say, well, as long as they don't go there, I won't lose my temper. As long as they don't bring this up, as long as they don't, you know, uh, d provoke me in this manner, as long as they don't cross this line. But if they do, then I listen, I'll be justified in just letting all that out and unloading on them. Can I say to you today, no, you won't. According to James chapter 1, James chapter 1 tells us that our wrath does not bring God glory. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. It's when you and I react in a way that the world don't expect. That's what brings him glory. It's when you and I exercise our rights and strengths and meekness. Our right and strength to have God take up this cause and intervene in these matters. Friend, listen, if you, if you study the life of Jesus, you study the life of Paul, you'll see that these men were not doormats to society. Jesus told the Pharisees, and so did John the Baptist, told the Pharisees they were like snakes, like vipers. <laughs> did you know there's people that handle them? There is a guy on the internet, I don't know his name, the guy breeds rattlesnakes. <laughs> ladies, you single ladies this morning, how many would like to date that guy? I mean, he breeds rattlesnakes. You know what I'm saying? He has crossed a cane break rattlesnake with a diamond back. And he has got this hybrid that weighs. You'll see him on live. You won't go look at him. Not that you might want to waste your time doing that. I know I'm a little morbid in that way. I just happened to run across him. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting. He's got this rattlesnake. He weighs 30, I think he weighs 30 pounds. He'll get him out of his tank. This thing's, I don't know, he's, he's six feet long, I guess. Got a big old head, about like your hand. I was got about, four, about 12 or 14 rattles. And he'll get him out and he'll just hold that thing and he's got him up and he all this, I mean, he can just work him. Just what he said, he's so used to me handling him and all this kind of thing. <laughs> Talking about, you know, how gentle he is. But you know what he does? He never gets, he never gets within range of his head. <laughs> Always got his head away from him. Why? Because he's still a rattlesnake. <laughs> yes, he's still a rattlesnake. 
And this fellow's handling that. And did you know there's people that handle these things? Jesus told the Pharisees. John the Baptist told the Pharisees. He said, you're like vipers. You can handle a viper, I guess, if you know how. You can handle a viper, I guess, if you got enough nerve. But at some point, if you're not careful, he's going to bite you and kill you. Jesus was relating that to these men who had this who had this uh, prideful spirit. And, and at some point, I mean, they look pretty harmless. They look pretty tame. But he's basically saying, oh, he's saying, listen, he, he told them this. He said that you will traverse land and sea to make a proselyte. And he said, when you do, they are twice the child of hell and then you, as you are. <laughs> That's what he said. In other words, you're like poison to people. Yes, you're eventually going to cause death to people. People with a meek spirit are not like that. People with a submissive way are not like that. And you might say, well, how should we pray then? If we're not to pray for humility, we should repent for being prideful, self-centered, and insecure. That's how we should pray. Yes, Lord, forgive us if we sense, listen, if we have that desire to be in control, we have that desire to be respected. All of us want to be loved and respected. But if we're willing to embellish ourselves to get that respect, if we're willing to build ourselves up somehow, if we're willing to make things look really better than they are, all because we're so insecure that we're afraid somebody won't appreciate us, won't respect us, or whatever, because we feel like you know we're losing face to somebody somewhere, somehow, I'm here to tell you that's pride. And so we're to pray to be, listen for, to be helped in that, to be forgiven of that. Friend, we're to pray, listen, that the Lord will bring in that, uh, if you will, that, uh, that, uh, that meekness into us. And we'll start focusing on who we are and on who he is. Look at the Apostle Paul. The Bible tells us, Nathan's got this verse back there. The scripture tells us in, in Numbers I think it's 12 too. I may be wrong about that. But the Bible tells us that Moses was the meekest man. The meekest man in Israel. The meekest man on the face of the earth. Look at that. He's the meekest man. Did you know that even historians today say that he's one of the greatest leaders that ever lived? Moses. You might say, well, I understand that because Moses was 40 years in that desert or that uh, uninhabited place out there, tending the sheep of his father-in-law. He did that 40 years. So it shouldn't be too hard for Moses to be too meek. It shouldn't be too hard for Moses not to think so much of himself. Look at all the rigors that goes with what he done for 40 years. you gotta, you got to keep in mind, Moses left the palace to go there. Moses grew up as a prince of Egypt. He left the palace to go Listen to that desert place. Moses was one time he knew what it was to be in the lap of luxury. He knew what it was to have every advantage. As a matter of fact, Luke tells us in Acts that he was taught in all the ways of Egypt. He had the highest Ivy League education that you could have in the day. He knew what all that was about. But yet, through in that in that wilderness if you will out there the Lord taught him what meekness we know this why because when the Lord spoke to him from the bush what did Moses do Moses took his shoes off didn't he an act of submission he said take your shoes off for the land for the ground where you're standing is holy ground Joshua was another one that did that took their shoes off in other words they got meek they got humble and God used them is there anybody Anybody that had as much pride, anybody that was willing to do as much damage, to be as injurious, that's what he called himself, as the Apostle Paul. My goodness, Paul said that he was, he was rising, I'll use this term, he was climbing the ladder, in the, listen, above all his peers. Paul said that he injured, he, 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 uh, that he wreaked havoc in the church. He did it because he said, I thought I was doing God a service. Not only was he doing it, but he thought he was right in doing it. He was not meek. He was not humble. No, anything but that. But after, after his encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road, 
Paul writes this in 1 Timothy 1 and 15. He said, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He said, of whom? I am chief. He said in Philippians chapter number 3, he gave us a list of all of his Hebrew qualifications. All of the people that was opposing him, all of the temple council, the Sanhedrin that he was once a part of, the Pharisees that he was a group of, listen, grew up under the teaching of Gamaliel, the greatest teacher in the Pharisees movement. And he said this, he gave us, he said he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, talking about being of the tribe of Benjamin, how he kept the law outwardly, how nobody could, you know, could, uh, could uh, ridicule him or nobody could uh, say that he didn't, all these kind of things. Friend, nobody could dispute that. He gave us this whole laundry list of things that he did in Philippians chapter 3. Then he gets over here and he says, but I count all of that as dung or just refuge that I might win Christ. In other words, he humbled himself. He became meek that he might be blessed of God, that he might be used of the Holy Spirit, that God might work in his life, that grace might be enhanced in his life. Friend, I'm telling you, when I look around this particular church, because this is where you allow me to serve, and this is where the Lord has me, and I'm privileged to be here, but when I look around it and I see gaps in these pews where somebody could be sitting or if there's things that we're dealing with, friend, that, you know, could be better or there's things that needs to be addressed, things like that. And this and there, there's those things in all churches. But when I do that, hey, I don't look at you and point a finger and think it's your fault. Listen, friend, I know, hey, I know that number one, first off and foremost, that God, listen, that he has called me, that he can use me, that he has, that he will, that he can and I'm trusting in him to do that amen and provide what we need make a difference in what we need some of you sitting here this morning you may not even know who it is that's watching your life but friend some of their greatest blessings is seeing what you're doing or being a part of some of the things that you're active in and, and friend that they are benefiting from and they equate that to the goodness of God. Why? Because you have a meek, quiet spirit. <laughs> because you have a gentle way about you. Because they don't see you flying off the handle every time you face a challenge or every time that somebody would upset you. They don't see you falling apart. They don't see those kind of things taking place and they see that you're willing to allow somebody else to be blessed. You're allowing somebody else to be honored even if you really should have been honored yourself. You allow somebody else to do that. One of the churches I was serving really struggling and I was thankful as I am right now today for everybody that came through the door. Everybody, whether they be a young person you know, it's easy to be thankful for young families that brings a lot of kids and builds up your Sunday school and builds up your, your children's ministries and fills up the church and all that. Easy to be thankful for those. Easy to be thankful for people like that. Well, never mind. That, bring, that puts into the offering. Easy. Yeah, never easy. Be thankful. Be thankful for that. It's easy. Easy to be thankful for people with talent that come and play and that sing. And easy to be thankful for folks that show up in faithfulness. Friend, I'm telling you, but did you know something? Hey, we've always put a value on everybody that comes in, no matter how old you are, how young you are, anywhere in between, you're valued. As I said last week, listen, you don't need anybody, anything, especially me, without the people being here. None of this stuff is needed. None of it. But in this one particular place I was serving, never did really get to have a whole lot of people coming. I was there 14 months. Thankful to say it's doing great today. Thankful to saying it's really blessed today. But there was two fellows that came there. One of them, he was a kind of an autistic young man. I don't know how old he was. Big, big fella. And he wanted to play guitar so badly, but he just couldn't do it. But he, he'd bring his guitar, and I think it was even missing the bottom string. <laughs> and he'd bring it. And then we had an older man. 
he had some challenges, he had some issues, and he could play his mandolin some, but he, he couldn't hear it any hardly anymore, and he couldn't make his fingers work too much anymore. And believe it or not, back then before my chronic throat troubles got going, every now and then I'd be asked to sing. Well, they asked me to sing. And so I got up to sing. Well, without asking, without expecting it, this young man got up with me with his five-string guitar. This fella got up with me with his mandolin. Neither one was in tune. <laughs> so tried to sing the song. Boy, they just stood right up there with me, and they, you know, they, they frailed their instruments and tried to play and all that. So when we got done, I thanked them. And folks after the service told me, said, how did you do that? Sing with that going on. You know, with that obvious distraction trying to do that. How did you do that? But did you know after I got finished, they just, they, folks clapped. The folks that were there, they clapped. And I glanced over to that little old fella and that older fella, and they were just smiling. It was almost like they were about to take them a bow. They were just smiling. And I thought, Lord, I don't know why you asked somebody to ask, or you led somebody to ask me to sing. But I believe it was to bless him too right there. And I thanked him for helping me. It was to bless him too right there. Where Cindy and I live, down that little dinky road, we share it with 12 more houses down there, 12 more people. And the Lord has blessed us. We, we pay the most taxes down there. Got the most property down there. Every time somebody would pass away, they'd want to sell it to us. And so as we, you know, as all that got started and folks got to live it in there, and you'd have some people that, you know, they would, it's like they own the road. I mean, you'd, you'd have to move for them, this kind of thing, all that. And, of course, the devil, you know, he'd speak into your mind and try to stir up your pride and say, you're the one that owns the most property down here. You live down here. If anybody ought to have the right to this first, it's you. He said that to me one day, spoke that into my thoughts. And you know what I did? I said, Lord, if you'll bless me to do it, I'm going to let everybody that I meet coming in here go in before me. I'm going to let every one of them go in before me. I could see a car coming, I'd look for me a place to get off the road. Let them come in before me. Now listen, I'm not bragging about that. That's not my point. But you know what? Half them people, I have no idea who they are. Some of them have stayed a long time, and I know them. Did you know every one of them speaks to me? Every one of them appreciates that. Every one of them, are, they like that. They know my old green truck. I mean, they like that. They like that I let them come in. You know, it's a blessing to me, Heath, that I can do that. Why? Because, friend, hey, they, they're renting. Nothing wrong with renting property. But they're renting. They're not there all that long and they're gone. Some of them there longer than others. But the point is, they don't own anything there. A lot of times, you know, you never know where they go or what they do or anything like that. But the thing is, it's just a little way of, of saying to them, you're somebody. Everybody loves to have that said to them, don't they? In a meek spirit, you can do that. In a gentle way, you can do that. One of the things that aggravates me the most is if I'm talking to somebody, like they're here and I'm talking to somebody, maybe I don't know them, that kind of thing, and I just speak to them, whatever, and they just kind of look at you and ignore you. Don't answer you back. Make you feel about that big. Now, I have that happen sometime. Have that happen out in my work world sometime. After all, I'm driving a 94 pickup truck around. <laughs> I'm working by myself. Cindy don't like it, but I'm wearing a pair of shoes, and the whole end of them is almost gone. I've got a brand new pair just like them at home. I got better shoes, but I'm trying to see how long the soles will last. Yes, that's what I'm doing. The tops are coming apart. That's what I'm wearing. That kind of thing, and, and, and you know, they look at me like they're in new trucks. They've got big business going, some of them. I'm not saying everybody's that way, but some are that way. And if I could, if I'd let it, it hurt my feelings. 
really bad. And it does a little. But when I get, get my stuff got, you know, get my parts bought, my materials bought, get back in my truck and I start to leave, sometimes that's still weighing heavy on my mind. And I'll say to the Holy Spirit, I'll say, Lord, I can't really blame them for not talking to me. I'm not anybody. I'm not anybody. Listen, in Christ, I am the righteousness of of God. Listen, I'm the righteousness of Christ and in, in, in Him. 2 Corinthians 5 21. Listen, in Christ I am the head, not the tail. In Christ I am blessed. In Christ I'm a royal priesthood, a holy generation. In Christ I'm all those things. But in the flesh I am nothing. Nothing. I said, Lord, I couldn't blame them for doing that. But I'm thankful that I still am who I am in you. What am I saying? I said these things, and I can't speak personally about you. You can only speak personally about me. I'm just telling you, yes. I mean, even, listen, even in the Lord, you face things that could discourage you. You face things that would hinder you. You face things that would disappoint you, disappress you, depress you. I mean, disquiet you you face those things but in meekness today in meekness in humility you always have the help of the Lord you always have the presence of the Holy Spirit he works through people like that he thrives in that atmosphere John the Baptist called as I said he called the Pharisees he called them snakes and vipers Jesus went into the temple. He made him a little cord. It was an imitation, if you will, of a scourge, of a whip. And he made that out of ropes. And he went in and he ran those people out. He said, all, all the world, all nations call, call this a house of prayer. Call my house a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. Boy, he didn't look too meek, did he? Doing that. But that was controlled. He had that authority. Matter of fact, the Jews asked him, said, who gave you the authority to do that? He said, I'll ask you a question. John the Baptist, was his ministry of God or men? You remember what the scripture said? They said, well, we say it was of God. He'll say, why do you believe him? We say it was of men. Then the people will turn against us because they held John a great prophet. So they said, we can't tell. He said, well, neither do I tell you. Why couldn't he tell them? Why wouldn't he tell them? Because they were prideful. They were self-centered. They were stealing God's glory. They were exerting their own authority. But listen, in meekness you'll hear from God. In meekness you'll see these things. Nathan, I'm not going to put you through all that, brother. I believe the Lord's finished right there. I had all sorts of scriptures, especially from the Psalms, where it talked about God's blessings to the meek. The Bible tells us in Zephaniah to seek meekness, to seek that. The Bible tells us that God has promised a lot of things to those who are meek. Let me go over my list real quick. We won't read the scriptures. But my, my list that I got down that I had worked out, uh, that he had promised to meekness, to people of meekness. Listen to what he said. He said, let God fight your battles and control your anger. Luke 6, 29. By the way, what if Jesus had been a temperamental person? Well, you and I would not be saved today. Can you imagine the, listen, the restraint it took when he could have did all these things? As a matter of fact, Philippians chapter 2 tells us that even though he was equal with God, listen, even though he was equal with God, he did not. He made himself of no reputation. In other words, he would not operate in that. He, he told the uh, he, he told the disciples, he said, I can presently call 12 legions of angels to help him on the cross. But meekness was the way he operated. It's a fruit of the Spirit. That's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It's Im impossible to um, restore someone back to fellowship and right standing without meekness. That's Galatians 6, 1 and Ephesians 4 and 2. It's a must in teaching and in uh, teaching the Scriptures the ways and the doctrines of the Lord. Got teaching going on, going to happen tonight. You'll find that in 2 Timothy 2, 25 and Titus 3 and 2. It's a must in understanding the scriptures. You'll find that in James 1 and 21 and James 3 and 13. 
precious is it in the sight of the Lord. We read that verse to you this morning. And God made special promises to the meek. They are the most like his son, by the way. When you're prideful, when you and I are prideful, self-centered, temperamental, desiring our own glory, we're, we're not, we're, listen, that's the most like the devil we can be. But in a meek and quiet spirit and in a gentle way, then we become like Jesus. These are some promises that he made. Satisfaction and provision. That's Psalms 22, 26. Inherit the earth and delight in peace. That's Psalms 37, 11. Strength and victory. That's Psalms 147 and 6. God has pleasure. Look at that. Has pleasure in the meek and he beautifies their lives. That's Psalms 149, verse 4. He gives the meek back what was taken from them. That's Isaiah 11 and verse 4. And for the meek, joy continued, continually increases. That's Isaiah 29, 19. Why, how does that happen? Because he contents our heart in him. Yes, we don't have to defend ourselves and become all that. No, we don't have to exert, listen, exert our own ways because we're trusting in him. He's contented us. The meek will, cha- will be in charge in the millennium. That's Matthew 5, 5. By the way, the Beatitudes does what? It describes to us who Jesus is, and it tells you and I how to have a blessed life in him. That's what it tells us. Listen, Stephen was a meek man. In Acts 7, 60, the scripture said, he asked the Lord to lay not that sin to their charge. Jesus, in Isaiah 53, verse 7, the Bible tells us that he opened not his mouth, Notice, notice as Nathan's got that verse up there, all these things would be attributed to our Lord, and he was able to do something about it. Listen, as Miss Sandra comes, as Brother Donald comes, and our fellows return, let me ask you these questions. I got them wrote down, and I want to use them today. Does our relationship with our Lord give us value, or do we strive for the world's approval? Do we justify our anger, temper, tantrums, Bad behavior as just being a natural, uh, being natural to who we are. Do we do that? Do we use threatening words and postures to get our way? Can we do, or can and do we really trust God with our lives? What about it this morning? If you have a heart's desire for God to use you, you have a heart's desire, listen, for Him to. Be able to work, listen, work his grace through you and me. You want that blessed life that he's promised, that anointing that he provides. And can I tell you, church, it's going to only come through a meek and a quiet spirit. It's it's only going to come through humility, humility. I don't know what the doors that the Lord has opened up for me. Just because people felt like they could approach me. I'm not the only one that says that. You're sitting here today and you could say the same thing. There's people that might approach you and ask you certain things, ask you to pray for them, ask you your opinion on things, contact you when yes, they are maybe in a, you know, in a in a in a in a battle or something challenging or, or under a burden or something like that. Friend, the reason they're doing that is because they have confidence in you. And they see that meekness and that gentleness, and they feel like that they can do that. I don't know what the funerals I've had. Can I say it this way? Just from, just from doing business at City Plummet. And that's something. They didn't know any more preachers. They didn't know other folks. That's not too easy sometimes, especially when you don't know their life too much and you can't associate a lot of things to the goodness of God. But the reason they did it is because they just, they said, oh, he's, he he believes. He's like the Lord in that regard. You might say, you know, I get tired of being a Christian and never being invited, never being included, never being respected in certain, you know, certain circles. All these kind of things. Listen, just glory in that. Because the reason you're not, the reason that they don't is because they don't see you as worldly. They think it'd be offensive to you. (laughs) 
they think you might bring up your faith. People would, people would refer me to people. 99, listen, almost 99% of the time, if they referred me to people and they included in that fact that I'm a preacher or a pastor, I didn't have to worry about that person calling. Mm -mm. Why? They're afraid you're liable to witness to them. <laughs> afraid you're liable to tell them about your faith. Now, for some, they would call you just because of that, thinking maybe you'd be honest with them. But can I say today, friend, listen, I'm just, I just want you and I to understand this morning that the Lord honors. I'd have read it to you right there. He values highly a person that will, on purpose, humble themselves, that listen, that will foster and that will cultivate a meek, gentle spirit. He does that. And he uses that for his honor and his glory. Bow with me and I'll ask you to stand in a moment. Father, thank you. Thank you that you came. And even though you were the God of glory and you still are. Even though, Father, the Bible calls you the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Even though, Father, you came with all authority in heaven and in earth, and the Bible declares to us that at your name every knee will bow of things in heaven and earth and under the earth. The Bible tells us who you are. Even the devils, when they were cast out, would cry out and say, We know you, thou Son of the Most High. Father, we know who you are. The Pharisees, the Jews, feared you until their day came. You told the disciples, my time is not yet. They told you, Father, that don't go into that, don't go into, uh, into Jerusalem or don't go here, don't go there because they're seeking to kill you. You said, I've got to work while it's day. In other words, don't worry, men. There's going to be a time when they'll have an opportunity, but it's not now. It's not now. My time has not come. Father, when the Jews told you how impressed they were that even the devils uh, were subject to their word. Lord, we remember what our Lord said when he said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. In other words, he wasn't impressed with that. Satan's already been defeated. When Satan himself tempted our Lord and could do nothing with him. Father, our Lord said that man would not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We just read today, Father, that you value highly a meek, a quiet, a gentle spirit, a humble person that will honor you. I can't speak for everybody, Lord, but I do know that every now and then pride will well up in my life. Every now and then frustration comes into my life. Every now and then, Father, the desire to maybe do something myself or control it or whatever would come into my life. Every now and then my temper does flare. Every now and then if someone would say, you got to bite your tongue or whatever you got to do. Every now and then those things do happen. But, Father, as it was sung a while ago, always we can depend on you. Always you're with us. Lord, help no one to go out of here this morning. Lord, with that baggage of pride hanging on their life. Go out of here this morning and say, well, I know I could do better. I'm just not willing to. I'm not ready to. Go out of here with any sort of spirit of rebellion about them today. Father, help them to know and realize that you are the one who has blessed their lives. Someone might say, oh, he's not the one that's doing my job. Oh, Father, you're the one that's blessed them with the strength and the ability, the understanding, the opportunity to do it. Somebody might say, he's not the one that's earned his spot on my team or whatever, but you are the one that has blessed them with that ability. He's not the one that has caused these things to happen, but yes, you are the one that allowed that to take place. Father, when I look at my life, it's the things, the messes, that I'll have to attribute to myself and the blessings I have to attribute to you. Thank you, Father, for the good things that your children do for people. Thank you, Father, for the honor they bestow upon you, and thank you for that humble, meek, quiet, without complaint spirit, Lord, that you have, have stirred into their heart. Let nobody leave this morning, Father, 
taking with them a hindrance, help them to give that burden to you and allow you to cause your promises to take place in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.
thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for staying with us after lunch. <laughs> Hope that everybody has a good rest of their Sunday. And do remember Bible study tonight. I think got all of our teachers back now, and so I know your classes are looking forward to that. We're certainly praying for all of our teachers. And as I just read to you today, uh, if you're here this morning, you said, I'm not real sure about tonight. Hey, through that humble, meek approach to the Lord, he'll just flood and fill your hearts with exactly what you need. Amen. And so, uh, so do remember that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for continuing to pray for Mr. Tedford. I know you have been. Thank you for keeping that up. I just thought about little is much when God is in it. Hallelujah. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. Good to have Brother Blake Foster with us today. We certainly appreciate all that Brother Blake does and all the different ministries that he organizes and is involved in. I want to ask Brother Blake if he'll dismiss us today, if he'll do that, Brother, Brother Blake. Austin, yes. If there's whoever's tending the hell's gate, yeah. firing off to have a service. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. And that's worth going to see, Brother Blake.